Welcome to Be Happier in Spite of Your Life with your host, Ann Reed. Come join the conversation as Ann will focus on helping you feel happier and thrive instead of just survive. Ann shares some of her life experiences and how she has learned to overcome her own painful times. So please welcome the host of Be Happier in Spite of Your Life, Ann Reed. everyone and welcome to my show be happier in spite of your life and today I do have a guest who has a unique view into mental health and anxiety in our college age population so he will be sharing some of his observations experiences and even some advanced training in this area but first I want to welcome you to the show and hope you've learned something throughout this month with anxiety being the main feature. And um, also look forward to what we have coming up for June, but I'm not giving you all those details yet. You're going to have to wait. First, I'll do a little more intro about me. My name is Ann Reed. I am a certified life and executive coach. And I've chosen to really concentrate on helping people be happier or sir thrive in spite of what is going on in their life. I really work to help people overcome their pain points and make a better or a bad situation a little bit better. All of us have horrible things that happen in our lives at some point, but it's really how we deal with them and our attitudes that mean it, whether or not it can derail us for a long time and we'll just be miserable, or if we can manage to find some joy in each day. Also, good and bad things do coexist. So you may have just heard that a family member went into the hospital and has a not very good prognosis on the day, maybe you just got an advancement in your job. So it is okay to feel both. I do not ever want to come across like we don't have negative feelings and we should avoid them, but I really do concentrate on the happier ones. I also want to give a shout out to a women's virtual conference and it's free and it's going on, it's starting today, runs for four days, and I am one of the speakers. So I'll give you a minute to get a pad and paper, but uh, Sheena White, who is a financial, or she calls herself a pocket CFO, and is a scaling up coach and has been a guest, has put together 20 women and each of us has a 20 to 30 minute segment on our specialty. And it is free to women entrepreneurs. So if you are interested in learning something, I suggest that uh, you take this link. There will be five people each day. It's on demand. And again, today is the first day. So the link will be H https colon two backslashes rebrand r e b r a n d dot l y backslash n capital a n n e read r e i d again once you register you can do one day or all four so just want to put that out there for you Okay, so we are going to talk about anxiety and then that leads into mental health and college age population today. And so I did a little bit of research. You know how I like for you to learn something and be somewhat inspired. Um, and we'll let John know our guest go into a lot more details on this. But I did find some, some, just some basic data 
And the first is from something called COVID States, which is a consortium of universities that had the computational and research capabilities to really start tracking things at the beginning or early 2020, which coincided obviously with our pandemic. And they were saying that in the latest survey, which I think was, I think it was February of this year, this article was written in May 23, that among 18 to 24 year olds, 44% meet a criteria for some kind of depression and 24 it's moderate to severe there fortunately the rate is going down somewhat in the last uh, year is the pandemic and our accommodations to it have lessened um they're less in that age group are saying they're avoiding public places or contact with others, et cetera. But there are still a large group who say that they're quite lonely. So that was sort of interesting to me that it really trended up and is coming down somewhat. But I know one of Jono's beliefs is that there really will be long-term implications on anxiety and mental health from the pandemic. So we'll discuss that more. Um, another thing is that suicide, and this is from Best Colleges, uh, is the third leading cause of death in adults 18 to 24. And it causes about 21% of all injury-related deaths in this age group excuse me. <clears throat> so to me, this is a very vulnerable population and they have been hit with many things, external things that could cause anxiety and uncertainty in their lives. I mean, each generation has something, you know, whether it's Pearl Harbor or 9-11, um, but they have really been hit with the pandemic with watching Russia invade the Ukraine. Um, they've, they've had a confluence of things that some other generations have not. So just as a review, anxiety by my definition, and this is a compilation of a whole group, um, of them are tense, nervous, unable to relax, sense of dread or fearing the worst, an interesting one that was also given is that you feel like others can see that you're anxious and are looking at you. And that in turn can make you more anxious. Um, I am going to talk a little bit more about resiliency. You know, I've talked about the four kinds of intelligence, which are true, the mental intelligence, the social, emotional, and really the ability to overcome adversity, but we'll go a little bit more into that when Jono comes in. So who is my guest? He is a college professor and started as a teacher in 1986 and is still continuing and all but 10 years have been at the college level. So he, he is intimately acquainted with this age group. If you look at his resume, it's mainly performance arts, performing and teaching. But he's also very interested in his student population and the internal and external factors which impact them, such as the pandemic, the invasion, and the other I forgot to mention, which may be the biggest, is gun violence, particularly in the schools. Also, really, a lack of trust in others and in information, like who do you believe, um, seems to really be playing a big role in some of their lack of ability to trust or feel safe. So to that end, Jono has completed two certifications from Florida State University. One is on trauma and resilience and the other is on college student well-being. Now, we're going to be talking more about 
kids in that 18 to 24 who are in college, but a lot of this does pertain to that age group in general. So, and I perceive Jono is an expert in the sense that he has both studied and watched these events. So, I'm Jono. I'm going to bring you on and say thank you for joining me and being really not only willing, I think, but almost excited to talk about this topic. So, in keeping with May being anxiety and mental, excuse me, <coughs> be glad when allergies are over. Anxiety <laughs> and mental health month. What do you think of my theory that while anxiety is real for many, there are a group, there's so many that it's almost become trendy. Throw you the hard one first. Uh, no, it's not even the hard one. Um, I have two observations, one of which is that um, the increase in anxiety is not an outgrowth of the pandemic. It's been, it's been increasing very steadily for the last decade. Um, the causes a wide variety and, and sort of go in some ways beyond our conversation here. Um, particularly in the cohort of students with which I have been working for these past seven years, uh, I do agree that um, they tend to try and outdo each other with their disabilities. Uh, not just their disabilities, but all the, the facets of, of their life. Um, 25 kids will come to, the, to chorus rehearsal or c class. Oh, I'm tired. Well, I'm more tired than you are. Well, we had a ridiculous conversation a year ago. I had 10 students here um, in Rhode Island for a retreat, and we were walking on the beach. And the argument they, that evolved was that I have flat feet, but my feet are flatter than yours. And I, <laughs> you know, trying to outdo each other in, in how awful things are. Wow. Um, but trendy, yes. Um, and I think there, there are a number of reasons that, for that. Uh, I think we create an atmosphere uh, to some degree of, of students wanting the attention that comes with being anxious or being differently abled in some way. Um, there's a lot of focus at the college level with um, uh, accessibility, rightly so. Uh, students who need accommodations uh, for physical issues and for emotional issues and for learning differences. Um, that, it, But we, we tend, I think, to make those accommodations well known, which is important, and we have to do that. But to a point that, well, gee, oh, maybe I should take advantage of that. Maybe I need that too. Uh, where it, it may or may not necessarily be appropriate. Wow. And again, I'm so, for, number one, I want to thank you a whole lot for totally blowing my premise out of the water that the primary causes of this current epidemic in this age group were due to the pandemic gun violence and the invasion of Ukraine, because none of those really existed 10 years ago. So thank you. <laughs> well, and it's interesting. I, but I, it's, I mean, when you ca compound that on top of that, not feeling safe. I mean, I know for me, the seminal moment was 9-11. I mean, again, I think each generation has something, but, you know, that was so close to home. I knew a lot of people who didn't come home that day. That's real to me, you know, and it kind of makes you, and then everything has shifted in response to that of when you're going through airport security or whatever. I mean, there've been a lot of shifts in our society because of it. But anyway, I, I just wanted to thank you for that. So, <laughs> uh, but I'm very curious in what, you perceive or have experienced as some of the the causes of this this age group really not getting a lot of traction or feeling capable or boarding on some real mental health issues and i should have said this caveat at the beginning particularly with anxiety i have experienced in some loved ones there is definitely a genetic pervasive anxiety. I also know that 
it can tend to run in families. So I don't want to minimize that there's, for some people, anxiety is real. Other people have trauma, PTSD, some other things for which anxiety is real. So I'm not minimizing it, but to me, it has gone beyond real factors and into a trend, but that's my side. Uh I, I agree with you. Um, and obviously it is very real for some people uh, for all the reasons and in all the ways you, you have mentioned. Um, m m I advocate that uh, the rise in anxiety across this generation of students, not just in individuals, but but really uh, uh, across this 18 to 24 year old category. And I it goes far younger than 18. Uh, we can talk more about that later. Uh, is not so much the pandemic but the response to the pandemic. Um, here is a cohort of students in their most formative years who had everything taken away. All activities, classroom experiences, socialization, um, opportunities to travel, opportunities to work, uh, everything was simply taken away by fiat. And the, the result is that, okay, now we're back, we're back in the classroom, we're back doing our jobs, we're back doing things. But it, it, in the same way that an animal remembers being punished for something, is that when is that gonna happen again? It happened once, yeah, it, it can happen again. Um, and we see that particularly with, with anxiety, but also with disengagement. Uh, okay, I'm going through the motions, I'm coming to class, I'm sitting here, I don't care. I'm not gonna do anything here. I'm here, uh, but it's that that apathy uh, that makes it very difficult to engage in a learning situation in a classroom. Did you see that pre-pandemic? Was that the apathy? Was that surfacing prior, or is that something you see now? Absolutely, a product of the wow. last three. Years. A... So that withdrawal or disengagement they maybe just didn't have the skills to come out of or to resume because they, I mean, I, the socialization and the social skills, I mean, we all had to learn new things like Zoom, but it's still different. And I, and they would be much more, they be in that age group, 18, 24 or younger, were much more formative and still learning the socialization skills right. and communication and whatever so it, they didn't were not able to bounce back as much as adults i'm kind of questioning this I, not, you know. not, so, not so much that they were unable to bounce back but they lost the opportunity to experience the social skills uh at an age appropriate time and and circumstance mm -hmm. uh, and again i i posit that it's it's wariness uh they're 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 not convinced that it's over that once again uh all of this could be taken away from them all the the opportunity that now is in front of them could be taken away again um the social skills that they lack uh are are the face-to-face -face skills uh that that are developed by playing a pick up game of basketball in the driveway or going to the beach on a whim or, and again, some people were privileged enough to avoid some of those draconian responses, but talking to the kids uh, in my classes and in, in, uh, in the dining room in all of the sessions with whom I have, in which I have contact with them, they're really horrible stories that come out. Uh, just the one you young share any? This, this one young woman who has a tremendously close uh, relationship with her grandmother who lives next door to her own home. And for 14 months, she was prohibited from any physical contact with her grandmother. It, it was restricted to standing in the yard and waving at her grandmother through the living room window. Um, that doesn't sound like the end of the world to you and me, perhaps. Uh, but for her, it was devastating. 
I would think 14 months would wear on me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you think it's not going to end, as you said, that weariness. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Any other? That's interesting. I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that. Well, the number of students um, who, for whose parents said, well, you're old enough. Uh, we'll set you up downstairs in the basement with the computer. And, uh, and, and they became troglodytes. Uh, they went down there and they sort of did their Zoom classes, if that's what was on tap for the or day. Or didn't do them. Or didn't do them, exactly. As someone who <laughs> forced into that particular situation as well, uh, it doesn't it doesn't make up for the face-to-face -face contact and the clap on the back and how are you doing today or everything okay you know you can't tell that through a tv screen <laughs> uh, but then when the when those students came out of the basements and in many cases it's literally as well as figuratively yeah. um they didn't quite know how to behave um they'd gone in as say 14 year olds and they came out as 16 or 17 year olds and there was a gap there well one of the things and I mean, you and I had talked in our pre-show, we're now far enough out from the pandemic that there are starting to be studies. I mean, you know, we're finally getting the look back as opposed to the living through. But one of my personal theories is that people don't talk a lot about yet, I'm sure it'll come up, but is touch. Mm. And I mean, I think it was one of the reasons a lot of people got animals, you know, to have a dog or a cat or something. And this would not be so much true of the kids we're talking about, because obviously they were not living independently. But for instance, the girl's grandmother, I mean, to be isolated and in your house or apartment or whatever. And it's not only the face-to-face connection but it's being able to touch another human being yes or something yep. living that i just don't think that's that kind of gets minimized but you know with three dogs and two cats that was not my issue <laughs> but um i could see how that that would be very depressing but you say you're finding the kids just pretty i don't know we talked some about apathy that what do you call it militant apathy militant apathy i didn't i didn't uh, coin the phrase the chronicle of higher education did and can you describe that or explain that i had never heard the term until we were talking about it um do we need a commercial break at this point I don't know, I'm not seeing it, but I may be the one who does not have my chat on. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering, and I, I, I ask you that question. Okay, so I'm not perfect. So I think it's an appropriate time to take a commercial break. Thank you, John. <laughs> <You're welcome. laughs> So this is Ann Reed on Be Happier in Spite of Your Life on Bow Brave TV Network. And obviously, I am not perfect. Just want to put that out there. And we will see you in two minutes. Thanks. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy sense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation author 
radio show host and coach, John M. Hawkins, reveals strategies to help gain perspective, build confidence, find clarity, achieve goals. John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse. Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them. We discover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. This is Bo Brave Media and Ann Reed, the host of Be Happier. And we are back with John O'Babbitt, and he is now going to give us a definition of militant apathy. Uh, I've experienced apathy throughout my entire teaching experience and, frankly, my education experience because I was pretty apathetic in, in high school <laughs> as well. <laughs> apathy That's is personal not apathy. Okay. <laughs> Apathy is not new in an educational environment. And usually if you have apathy coming back at you as a teacher from the students, it means eh, you may need to mix it up a little bit and you need to engage better. Um, militant apathy, which is what the Chronicle of Higher Education is how the Chronicle describes what we're witnessing in classrooms across the country and indeed across the world right now, is that almost belligerent apathy. Yeah, so what? Um, do I have my assignment to turn in? No, what are you gonna do about it? Uh, that kind of mindset, I mean, no one's ever said those words to me in that way, but uh, perfectly capable students have simply neglected, eh, I don't have it, I'm gonna turn it in, I don't care. Um, and that's a different obstacle, that's a different barrier to try and cross Again, fear of having everything taken away from them. Uh, this is pointless, that attitude. Um, this isn't gonna help me. Uh, I'm only here because my parents say I have to be. Um, I should already be out in the workplace and then I'm sitting here in your classroom. <laughs> I think it, it differs from student to student, um, but it feeds they feed off each other. So if you've got 12 or 15 of them in a classroom, they all can sense that vibe and it can be devastating to an instructor. I asked be, a group. Yeah, it'd be uh, tough to stand up there and see blank faces the whole time. Yeah, yeah. I, I, we had talked previously, I one class session of first year students where I was getting nothing coming back at me at all. And I said, okay, what is it that gets you out of bed in the morning? If you had anything you could do today, what would you choose to do today that you know lit your fuse or really got you excited? And 11 people sat there and stared at me. They couldn't come up with one single idea that oh, I'd like to go walk on a beach. I'd like to go on a shopping spree. I, I, nothing, nothing came back at me. At which point I decided we were going to go walk on the beach. And I said, well, leave your phones on the table. And we all walked outside and went down. Leave and... your phones? Oh, yeah. They couldn't take their electronics with them? <laughs> <laughs> but For it's all of you who are doing this audio, that was an expression of disbelief I just had. <laughs> but as we walked down toward the river, uh, it, it was deadly silence for the first four or five minutes by the time we got halfway down the hill, a couple of people were starting to have conversations. And by the time we got to the beach, people were talking to each other. And I didn't care what they were talking about. They were talking to each other. Um, and in the academic reviews, when the students uh, give their analyses of, of the course, that event, that day, was mentioned by three of the 11 as being when they remembered. Um, so there's all sorts of ways of dealing with it, uh, but militant apathy is a new thing. And that, to my judgment, is a direct result of the pandemic. 
and the, our response to the pandemic, I think more specifically. You also had shared that you were on a military base mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, sometime recently and had spoken with one of the commanding officers. A chaplain, a regimental chaplain. chaplain. Yeah, I was okay. down, at, down at Fort Benning, Georgia, uh, attending the graduation of my brother-in-law from basic training and uh, struck up a conversation with uh, a lieutenant who turned out to be the regimental chaplain for this training division or tra training regiment. And his question to me was, in academics, tell me what you're seeing. And I talked about militant apathy and disengagement and lack of retention. Mm -hmm. and, and he actually looked relieved because what was happening on the training reservation at Fort Benning, Georgia, was exactly what we were seeing at Mitchell College in New London, Connecticut. Uh, the training cycles were delayed at Fort Benning. The, the, the troopers would have to learn something on Monday that they would then use on Tuesday for further training. And they'd show up on Tuesday and they would have forgotten everything they learned on Monday. So Tuesday, you had to do Monday over again and then try to cram Tuesdays into Wednesday along with Wednesday. I mean, it, it, uh, that and the, again, the apathetic approach, uh, there was a fairly much higher percentage of suicidal uh, ideation uh, in the yeah. training cadre, uh, real problems, but all the same things we were seeing in that same age group at Mitchell College. And I, I understand now the relief I saw on his face because it wasn't a Fort Benning problem in the same right. way that it's not a Mitchell College problem. It is ubiquitous. And this gives rise to something I, uh, I presented to the faculty committee of the whole and, and, and all of the Mitchell staff last spring, a year ago. I believe that we're facing 15 to 18 years of having to rethink, reinvent the wheel every single semester as we get new groups of students coming through college and and our response to them is going to have to differ based on where they were when they lost three years you know, what grades were they in when they lost three years or two and a half years however you want to count it yeah. we we get to the end of one semester and we sort of think think oh we we figured we this out because yeah. I bet you were not the most popular faculty member by the end of that conversation. No. <laughs> He's the musician. Why is he talking to us about mental health? <laughs> um, but it, it, and it really is true. That's what we're seeing. Um, and it's not just year by year. It's literally semester by semester. Um, and, and fascinating uh, assessments uh, to discover that, okay, some of these first year students are older, they took a year off after high school, and sometimes two years off, and they were in the workforce, they were living on the economy. They have the resilience, they're engaged, they're here because they want to be here. Um, they're not just pipelined on from high school. Uh, so that's the expectation, this is what you're doing. Move on, move on, move on. Well, what possessed you to during the middle of COVID go back and get the two certifications on the trauma and resiliency and college student well-being what led you to that and what and if you want to talk about what you learned it's fascinating to me because I think it's stuff any of us as parents or even trying to deal with this age group as employees or what have you are going to have to deal with. Yeah. What, what prompted me uh, to seek the certifications from FSU, I was one of very few faculty members who took the choice to be in person for all my classes in the fall of 2020 and spring of 2021. Um, faculty were given a you know, the choice. You could be remote, you could be hybrid, or you could be in person and, mm -hmm. and in person for all of my classes. Um, bear in mind that 
in the fall of 2020, students were restricted to their dorm rooms. Right. They were basically locked down. The classes were being given, but uh, Metro College, where you were, they basically couldn't leave their rooms because meals were even brought to the lobbies. Correct. Correct. And they could go yeah. to class. They could come to class and my classes were in person so they could leave the dorm room and come to my classes, which were held in the in the Clark Center with 12 foot distances between tables and blah, 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 blah. blah. But anyway, it was face to face. Um, by the end of that semester, I had students coming to class who were not enrolled in the class. They were <laughs> just to get out of the dorm, I bet, or their rooms. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And, you know, you, you think about. Uh, a week locked in your room with food delivered is sort of silly and Not funny. Not for me, no. A month, a month of that is really difficult, and an entire semester is called hard time. I mean, <laughs> it feels you know, without benefit of parole. Um, there was a period of time where I spent three nights running in my office because the, there were students coming to my office to just vent and uh it was out of that that i felt i needed to do something and seek out some additional tools and to put in my toolbox um the two the two courses certifications were not particularly new information but they sort of structured it in a way that made you know uh, light bulb it a little differently yeah. or together oh, right. or whatever yeah. in, in ways that that made really good sense and and were able to be very useful to me um well one of my i i always talk about resiliency or in my four letter uh word for it is grit and that's mm -hmm. really that ability just to get through adversity to the other side and keep on going uh i know in our pre-show talks you were saying that was coping how what did you learn about resiliency was that talked about a lot because i think what i'm some of what i'm hearing from you is that this age group doesn't really have resiliency it's kind of like they're just flatlined a little bit they're still alive because they have a pulse and they're breathing but in a lot of ways they flatlined in life uh, yes, I agree. Uh, they are flatlined you know, in terms of resiliency and coping or grit, any one of those three words. No, resiliency was not part of the certification project. The, the certifications were more uh, acute and trauma related. Um, and judging, what did they consider trauma? What kind of trauma? Oh, any, trauma, anything from okay. physical, sexual violence to uh, uh, emotional trauma caused by the death of a family member or loss of a job, a wide variety of traumas, both physical and emotional, um, and and tools to really assess in the moment, is is this critical and does this need, you know, medical intervention or or can we talk through this and, and make it through the night, so to speak? Um, yeah, as part of our conversation pre-show, uh, my observations about resilience uh, are, are Align with yours in the sense that this cohort of students has great difficulty with resiliency. Um, the causes, I, I think, are, are rather widespread, and and they also predate the pandemic in my in my estimation. Um, we live in a in perhaps the the phrase nanny state is overstated, but I I feel very strongly about it um, that more and more uh, is taken on by local state and federal government in terms of providing services providing support providing help in times of difficulty um, and i think we've got two or three generations now that don't have the physical skills to get out of trouble i mean to get out of a problem to get out of a difficulty um, your example was that you know how to use a shovel yeah but you pay your your <laughs> your yard man to, to dig that that hole uh, i tried i knew how to use it and decided yeah. it was something i didn't want to do and i had an alternative so i chose it yeah, but you know, <laughs> how's that for <laughs> you know how to do it but i know uh, how right right i right. do and um, i think that's something that that 
you and I again had discussed that, but sort of basic life skills of putting it simply, putting dishes in the dishwasher, not even hand washing them or changing a light bulb. I mean, lived in this house 20 years and was a little surprised a week or two ago when I asked one of my kids change a light bulb and they didn't know where I kept them. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, oh, okay, I guess I get a D minus in parenting because that means I've changed all the light bulbs for the last 20 years. <laughs> that was a little bit of a shock. <laughs> but yeah, I think a lot of it. And I, this is my belief again. I think the more we personally know how to do and or resolve in our life, it gives us competencies, but self-confidence and competencies, which I think reduces our anxiety, depression, uh, probably even that basic apathy. It just, I mean, the more, it's not that we have to do it all ourselves. Like I said, I chose, <laughs> I knew what needed to be done and chose to have somebody else do it in this instance but I know what they're supposed to do. I know how long it should take, what they're gonna require. And it um, doesn't make me feel less than. And I think a lot of these kids, I don't think they feel good about themselves because then you wouldn't have anxiety or depression either and so much disconnection for many no, reasons. I think that's absolutely right. Um, at Mitchell College, which is where I am and have been, um, the percentage of students with learning differences and various neurodiversities is about the same as it is in the in the general population at large. It's not a, an institution specifically for uh, a type of student. Um, but my cohort of students in the performing arts is about 90% neurodivergent and with learning differences. Um, and that's great because the performing arts is where a lot of these students thrive. Um, it, it's an opportunity for them to shine and to succeed uh, where in some academic areas they struggle um, and they, they don't struggle as much in the performing arts. They, they're not judged in the same way. Um, what the biggest piece I have to overcome in my programs is usually with first year students, either with the famous college prep program or the first year at Mitchell, uh, is convincing them to eliminate the phrase, it's because of my disability. I can't do it because of my disability. Just. just or because I don't know how, if you want to take it out in the broad population and probably the soldiers at Fort Benning or whatever too. I don't yeah. know how, yeah. it's my yeah. disability. Yeah. It's the, the excuse. It's the excuse, exactly. And uh, in my very first class at Mitchell College, seven years ago, the student had been, had come to the first class and had gotten the syllabus and I had made clear all my expectations, what you bring with you to class and what you have to do when you get to class and et cetera, et cetera. And the second class arrived and the kid showed up without anything, had done nothing, had prepared nothing, had remembered nothing. And I asked him where his stuff was, where his notebook and his pencil or pen was. And he looked at me and said, well, I'm autistic. And I said, and I'm bald. And I have a strategy for that. I put on a hat. So now we're going to work on a strategy for you remembering to bring your notebook to class. Seven years later, he graduated. Was he bringing his uh, yes. required papers to class? <laughs> I see by the clock on the wall, we have one minute. All right. Well, we can. Um, I would love to when we come back have you share if you have any magic solutions for any of this of really helping the kids and i'll give you about two minutes so um Fair and enough. then also if you do want 
uh, people to be able to reach you. You're free to share your websites or what have you too. So yeah, absolutely. All right, so we are going to take our commercial break now. And this is Ann Reed on Bobave Media on Be Happier in Spite of Your Life. And we'll see you shortly. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality? But it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating. Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. You know, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416-529-7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well. Be aware. Be magical. Are you struggling to care for elderly parents or a spouse? Do you wonder if being a caregiver is making you sick? Are you worried about taking time off work to care for elderly parents and balance work, life, and caregiving? Has caregiving become exhausting and emotionally draining? Are you an aging adult who wants to remain independent, but you're not sure how? I'm Pamela D. Wilson. Join me for the Caring Generation radio show for caregivers and aging adults, Wednesday evenings, 6 Pacific, 7 Mountain, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern, where I answer these questions and share tips for managing stress, family relationships, health, well-being, and more. Podcasts and transcripts of The Caring Generation are on my website, PamelaDWilson.com, plus my caregiving library, online caregiver support programs, and programs for corporations interested in supporting working caregivers. Help, hope, and support for caregivers is here on The Caring Generation and PamelaDWilson.com. Hello, you're back with Ann Reed and John O. Babbitt on Be Happier in Spite of Your Life. And I threw out an ending question for John O. And that is with the high anxiety and the apathy and the depression and what have you, does he have any words of advice and any words of hope? Yes, fortunately, Good. I do. Uh, <laughs> There's no silver bullet. There's no silver bullet in any of it. Um, I think the, the the magic ingredient is compassion. Uh, and and in most cases, tough love. Um, huh. being, being able to say to these students, You've, you can do better. You have to do better. You will do better. And I love you for who you are but we can walk down this road together. That one young man who finally graduated after seven years, um, his whole family, extended family came to the graduation because it was a big deal for him. Uh, and I, I have intimately connected with his parents. <laughs> like calls at least yeah. uh, every 24 hours. Okay. Yeah, and you know, things like that. But I hadn't met, some of the aunts and uncles and cousins and everything else. And, and one family member asked Michael, introduce us to your teacher here. Tell, why, why is he so important here? And Michael's response was that Professor Babbitt's boot print is on my butt. <laughs> and probably true. <laughs> it's absolutely true. But the fact that he recognized it and he was willing to say that uh, Michael did the work. Michael graduated. I didn't graduate for him, but I sure as heck helped. <laughs> so why do you keep teaching? It is the most, Mitchell College and the work I do at Mitchell College is the most professionally and personally rewarding experience in 40 years of teaching. Wow. I make a difference there. That. I think that's all any of us ever want is to make a difference. Yeah. Yeah. 
and, a, and whether it's an institution or an individual student, or in my case, the people I coach, I mean, that's why you do it. Because mm -hmm. there are certainly times that you would, <laughs> occasional times, anyway, really, you'd rather be doing something else, like not sitting in traffic or uh, listening had, to them I, whine or whatever. I had a full head of hair when I started there. <laughs> Nah, I don't believe you. <laughs> I didn't have any gray hair till I had kids either, so we're even. <laughs> wow. Well, if somebody wanted to reach out to you, rather, it's a, uh, and oh, I must say, we never discuss social media. That was also on our list of topics. So maybe some other point we'll, t we'll come back and, uh, go through some of these things again and find out if you have any updates, but the impact of social media too. And on the, I mean, it was both a good thing during the pandemic to have that way of connection and communication. But I think it's also a negative thing when the kids go into the basement, when they, maybe you're supposed to be doing something else like classwork and it's all social media. It, it's certainly a double-edged sword. There's no question. Yeah. But anyway, if someone wanted to reach out to you and hear more wisdom or he has a lot of funny anecdotes, guys. So <laughs> <laughs> get your opinion or do something. How can they reach you? Uh, my email is Jono, J-O-N-O at JonathanBabbitt.com. And there's Jonathan Babbitt spelled for you right there on the screen. There are the largest part of the audience will not see the screen, so right. I would spell it. <laughs> A-O-N-A-T-H-A-N-B-A-B-B-I-T-T. -T. You need three B's and two T's in the last name, so JonathanBabbitt.com. Okay. Well, I hope. I certainly enjoyed talking to you and having you laugh at me, my abysmal timekeeping on this one. Um, and hope we can do some projects together at some point. And I hope that there's some people who reach up to you. So thank you very much for giving up your afternoon to be with me, Jono. I appreciate it. it. Truly my pleasure and <laughs> the opportunity to talk. All right, before I sign off, I wanna do a shout out and a thank you. I have heard that there is a very special young man who is one of my most avid fans and never listen, misses a segment. So I want to say hello, Parker, and thank you. If you want to reach me, it's on Instagram. It's at Reed, R-E-I-D, coaching. Facebook is at and A-N-N-E, Reed Coaching 111. LinkedIn and Pinterest are Ann Reed. And my website is readcoaching.com. And again, if someone wants uh, to join the Women's Virtual Conference of 20 Women Entrepreneurial Conference, sorry, wants to hear from 20 women's entrepreneurs uh, today, tomorrow, and the next two, so that is May 30th through Friday, June 2nd. It is free. They can go to https colon backslash backslash rebrand dot ly backslash and read. I hope you learned something and we were thought provoking and I will see you around next week. Thanks for joining me. Bye-bye. This has been Be Happier in Spite of Your Life with host Ann Reed. Tune in each week as Ann shows how each of us has the choice to make the best of things with the reward of sustaining better health, wealth, and relationships. Tuesdays, 3 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave TV Network.